Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Adam Witte from Purdue University, we hope you are having a great day and are ready to learn a lot. Today begins Emerald Ashbor Awareness Week, and with that in mind, we've put together a webinar that will take you from the discovery of the pest, what we've learned along the way, and we'll end up with what steps you can take to keep EAB out of our ash trees. The presenters today include myself, as someone who's worked on communicating about this pest and helped announce its discovery in 2002, along with Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension in Lucas County, who has also worked on EAB education and outreach since EAB's discovery in Ohio. And today we also welcome Lee Greenwood from the Nature Conservancy. And she has worked as the manager of the Don't Move Firewood campaign, which is a vital effort to help keep invasive species such as EAB from destroying our woodlands. She's been running the campaign since it was launched in 2008 and has seen it grow from a few small efforts in a few states to its current reach of nearly all 50 states, plus good partnerships in Canada as well. You'll see the chat pod on the left of the screen. Please feel free to type comments and questions there. We will make a note of them and we will be responding to questions after the presentation to keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Please stay tuned until the end because we would like you to get your feedback and we'll be providing a link to a survey that we'd like you to participate in. As well, for those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is necessary for us to process those CEUs. The first 10 people to participate will receive an EAB goodie bag. As well, the first 10 people um, that have, I'm sorry, if you've received a goodie bag in the past, we appreciate your continued feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing after words at emeraldashbor.info. You will also find recordings for all of our previous EAB University webinars there. And please give us feedback about you as we always like to hear how we can make these better. Now with that, I'm going to bring up my presentation and we will start. All right, some of you know a lot may know a lot about what's going on with the EAB infestation. While some of you may be just beginning to ramp up on what's going on, especially if EAB has only recently been found in your area, I'm gonna give you a brief history on the pest and leading up to the present day. The first discovery of the emerald ash borer was in the Detroit area in Michigan in 2002. Not long afterward, it was found in the Windsor, Ontario, Canada area, which is Michigan's neighbor to the east. Since that time, the little green bug has killed tens of millions of ash trees in North America and has everyone who is involved with the forestry and tree industry, including the universities, federal and state agencies, scrambling to understand the pest and find the best answers to controlling it. It now has the dubious distinction of being the most devastating forest pest on the continent. The story behind its discovery and the subsequent chain of events that have brought us to this point involved many people, organizations, and a lot of hard work. To give you an idea of the scope of the problem back then, there were 11.65 million ash trees in the infested area of southeastern Michigan. Of that, 11 million are forest ash, with 5.5 million forest ash dead or dying. 65,000 of those are landscape ash trees, with 20, 290,000 dead or declining at that time, and no one knew why. This changed in 2002, June. A nurseryman brought larval samples into the Michigan State University Extension Office in Oakland County and stumped as what it was, the extension agent sent it to the Michigan State Diagnostic Lab 
where the resident bug sleuth made a guess as to its genus, but wasn't exactly sure what it was. So he sent it to the USDA Forest Service in Minnesota. The USDA sent it on to the Smithsonian Institution, where every insect specimen known to North America is kept. When the Smithsonian couldn't identify it, that meant it was not native to North America. But what was it? Well, they knew it was a word-boring pest, and that led them to confer with a couple of entomologists from the Slovakian region of Bratislava. They were beetle specialists who, fortunately, were able to solve the mystery. They identified it as Ag Agrilus planipennis, a wood-boring insect of Asian descent. But other than that, there wasn't much more they could share. Not much was known about this insect, except that it infests ash trees. Well, now what? The only other information found on the pest was a two-page discussion in Chinese in a book on international forest pests. Ho Ping Lu, then a postdoctoral student at Michigan State, was able to translate the information and contact its author, a Chinese entomologist. Unfortunately, this entomologist's work had been destroyed during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So researchers were starting from square one to understand this pest biology and life cycle, which is vital information if this pest was to be found and controlled or eradicated. Meanwhile, surveying by state and federal agencies began in southeastern Michigan in an attempt to get a handle on where this pest was and how far it had spread. In addition, master gardeners and extension specialists were ramping up to help take part of the surveying efforts. Quarantines were implemented in six counties in Michigan and under the quarantine, it is illegal to move ash trees, branches, lumber, firewood, and other materials unless chipped to one inch in diameter outside of the counties. There was also an eradication created, er, eradication plan created in hope of containing the pest. Meanwhile, we had to get the word out about the discovery of EAB. This is where I entered the picture because I helped Deborah McCullough, Michigan State's forest entomologist, who has been studying the pest since its discovery, get the word out about the discovery of EAB. And when she called our college's communications unit, I just happened to have the time that day to meet with her, and the rest is history. The article that she and I wrote in addition to others, including Michigan, the state of Michigan's De um, Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, contributed to the media blitz that hit the state in mid-July. The Michigan Department of Agriculture held a press conference in the Detroit area shopping mall where landscape ash trees were infested with EAB. And you'll see in this slide here, Deb McCullough, with an ash log in hand, explains to the media how EAB is killing ash trees. So, now that EAB is here, what's going to happen? How will it be stopped? And there were a cavalcade of committees created to get the job done. This kind of outlines what they did in the beginning as far as a species task force to help get the job done as far as figuring out what to do with EAB. As well, the EAB Communications Committee was developed by the Public Information Officer at the Michigan Department of Agriculture and myself. We decided to join forces in an attempt to provide some consistent, accurate, timely, and reliable information on emerald ash borer. We also invited the information specialists from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the USDA Forest Service, and USDA APHIS. Some of us were new at working with invasive species and others were veterans. What was unique about this group is that something like this had never been done before. Most times, each organization disseminates information independent of the others. With EAB inquiries hitting us hard and fast, this proved to be a better way to handle it. In addition, the Emerald Ashbor.info website was created in early 2003 with the goal of being a one-stop shop for all things Emerald Ashbor. Now, in 2003, we see that EAB has infested more ash trees than the six originally quarantined counties. Researchers are finding out more and more about EAB, and the money and the manpower is pouring into research and surveys for the pest in Michigan. Not long after EAB was discovered in Michigan, it was also found in Canada. 
Meanwhile, Ohio has found its first EAB infestation in 2003, and the Ohio State University and the Ohio Department of Agriculture joined forces with Michigan to work on research, outreach, and information about the pest. Maryland also found an infestation, but it was able to eradicate that infestation, or thought so it was believed back then. In 2004, Indiana found its first infestation, and Purdue University Extension and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources joined the fray. So here is, by 2004, it's pretty clear that e infestate, EAB infestations are far beyond the bounds of southeastern Michigan. It's also clear that infested nursery stock can account for some of the infestations, but for the most part, human movement of infested ash wood, like firewood, is the big culprit. So to give you an idea of what it's at stake, this is the native range of ash trees in North America. That's more than 8 billion forest and woodland trees. In addition, many more millions of landscape ash trees have been planted in municipalities across the continent. This kind of gives you a rundown of what's at stake. Here is the native range of emerald ash borer which is native to Asia, as well as adjacent Mongolia and Russia. People often ask, why isn't it a big problem there? Well, this is because ash trees and the insect evolved to a level where the ash trees have some defenses. North American ash trees aren't so lucky. By 2005, um, there were all the confirmed EAB infestations in the states and Canada were, create, were put on this, these maps that the USDA had created. We'd learned a lot about the pest since 2002 and especially ways to find it. And it looks like Michigan there is our thumb area is slowly becoming kind of looking like a big red blob. In 2006, more infestations of VAB were found in the tri-state area and outreach and information tools had increased and survey work intensified. In 2004, the EAB Communications Committee came up with the idea of creating an EAB Awareness Week, the week before Memorial Day, because Memorial Day heralds the beginning of the summer travel season. The first EAB Awareness Week encompassed three states, with the governors from all three states signing official proclamations endorsing EAB Awareness. EAB Awareness Week continues to this day, and numerous states and organizations like the Boy Scouts hold events to promote awareness. Survey efforts were stepped out outside of the infested areas and finding an easier way to survey and detect EAB led to the development of the purple traps that you may see. EAB is attracted to the color purple. This fo po photo depicts just one row of PVC pipe painted purple during the process of creating these traps. On the right is an example of the purple three-sided traps now commonly used in areas where EAB might be. Most states have areas where the USDA places these traps to check for possible infestations. In June of 2006, Illinois, Illinois found its first EAB infestation. In August of that year, EAB was again found in the once thought to be eradicated area in Maryland. By October of 2007, EAB was found in more places in Illinois and also in Pennsylvania. Also, in October, an EAB research and technology development meeting in Pittsburgh outlined much of what was being done to combat the beetle. This is just a small sampling of what was discussed during that meeting. Biocontrol had been ongoing since 2003. And though it is an important tool in EAB management, it is not believed that this will totally eradicate EAB in North America. By December of 2008, new EAB finds had been detected in Missouri, Virginia, Wisconsin, West Virginia, and in Quebec, Canada. Note that there are also more EAB finds in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Another issue that was gaining more and more importance is how to deal with all the dead ash trees. Municipalities were also coming to grips with the devastation and the financial burden EAB was creating. In May of 2009, it was found in Kentucky and Minnesota. And in June, it was found in New York. 
Now here's the 2010 map, which shows Tennessee and Iowa's addition to the new state with the AB fines. In this November of 2011 map, you'll notice that the states are less of a red blob mess. As it was decided, it was easier to document what counties were infested with EAB rather than every new EAB find in those states. Research at this time was taking a slight shift toward focusing more efforts on how to save ash trees by looking at differences between ash tree genetics in North America and Asia and what species of ash in North America may be more resistant to EAB than others. As well as breeding for EAB resistant ash, there was also more multi-year data on effectiveness of various insecticides and how many years of control some of them could offer. There were also multi-year studies on what happens after EAB comes into an area with regards to insects, animals, birds, and other plants, as well as an update on biocontrol efforts. In July of 2012, Connecticut became the 16th state to be infested with EAB and Kansas became the 17th state in August to have an EAB infestation. In 2013, New Hampshire joined the party in March 18th as a state with EAB infestations, followed by North Carolina in June, Georgia in July, and Colorado in September. Also, you'll notice on this map that the heavy blue quarantine lines have been redrawn. Movement is now allowed within these states to other states and areas as far as firewood. EAB continues to present numerous challenges. With municipal, state, and federal budgets shrinking, it's taking ingenuity to, find, to fight this pest with fewer dollars. I just wanted to let you know the Emerald Ashbore.info website keeps current with all the latest information, research data, and useful information about EAB. A couple of the important links to check out here, these are the EAB University webinars that we are putting on, which are a great way to find out more information that's up to date, unbiased, and researched about EAB. And also, I just this is, a, this is a brand new thing, the insect options for protecting ash trees from emerald ash borer has been updated and it will be on the emerald-dashboard.info site, should be either today or tomorrow. So that's a kind of a quick rundown. Um, be sure to take a look at the emerald-dashboard.info site if you would like to see more information about anything going on with EAB in the US and in Canada. We've also had some links added from some information from Russia and from other organizations that are also helping out with the EAB control effort. And I would thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any questions um, we could answer before we move on to Amy Stone's presentation, please feel to try, type them into the chat pod. All right. Looks like Mike has a question. Um, is the quarantine mentioned on the latest map slide a federal quarantine? New York has a 50 mile limit of fire of moving firewood. And Lee responded. So thanks, Lee. All right. Well, thanks, Robin, for kind of getting us up to speed on what is happening. My name is Amy Stone. I'm an extension educator with Ohio State University. And what I want to look at now is kind of an overall overview of what researchers and scientists had to learn about EAB and kind of all the information that's been gathered. Um, so even if you are a beginner in the world of Emerald Ash Borer, know that there are many people that have been where you are now and are willing to share their experiences. And don't ever feel like you need to recreate the wheel, uh, but beg, borrow, and steal information uh, that's been created in resources.
All right. So we know that it is Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week. Um, it should be the next Hallmark holiday, I think. Um, but it is also, we're celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the siling, signing of the Smith-Lever Act. So happy 100-year anniversary to the Extension Service. Um, a great way to get information out um, to the public. So one of the first questions that I'd like to ask is, where are you in the infestation? This scale is used by researchers and a, really a tool for practitioners to determine what the percentage of ash decline is and used as kind of a, a conversation piece when people are talking from different states or different regions or areas to kind of compare where they are at um, in the, the cycle of emerald ash borer. And you may look at some of these trees here on the screen now to some that look uninfested, very healthy, to the picture on the very bottom, um, kind of in a woodlot. Um, easily to, easy to identify which are the ash trees. Um, those are the dead ones. Um, and in many of the um, core infested states, that's very common to see. We do know that emerald ash borer equals just millions and ultimately billions of dead ash trees and that number just continues to grow. And it doesn't matter if those trees are between the street and the sidewalk, in an individual's landscape, in a woodland, or in a park, um, they're all susceptible to emerald ash borer. We'd like to do just a quick review of life cycle and as you'll see here on the slide, uh, there are some timing or dates um, associated with each stage of the life cycle. And typically this is um, kind of tied to Ohio, and so it may um, vary from state to state. But I know last week we began adult emergence um, in the southern part of Ohio. Typically um, it begins in, in you know, mid-May all the way through August uh, with a peak about two weeks after first emergence. Uh, those beetles will feed on the foliage of ash trees, find a mate, and then begin laying eggs um, on an ash tree. That egg will hatch and develop into a larvae that begins feeding through the bark um, into the tissue. Um, into the fall, we kind of go into a pre-pupal stage um, where it spends the winter. It pupates in the spring once the temperatures warm up uh, with one generation normally per year. If you're into phenology, um, scientists and researchers have found kind of what that the, the, the plant uh, bloom and the insect emergence coincides uh, with the black locust. And so um, in Ohio, uh, that's growing degree day 550 and maybe something that you'd want to kind of keep on your radar. The larvae of the emerald ash borer is the, the killing stage of the insect. The larvae live beneath the bark um, on living ash trees and they consume the phloem, the cambium, and etch the xylem causing that damage. This is a really good example of one single gallery. Um, you can see here where the, the egg was um, laid on the outside of the tree outside the bark um, and as that larvae developed and got larger And as it develops and gets larger, the gallery widens to finally we see here the exit hole or emergence hole um, of the insect. This just indicates um, that an ash tree is a ring porous tree, and so the water is transported only through the current annual ring, which causes um, death very, very quickly. And so we've got the bark, the phloem, and the cambium, and so they tend not to. Um, to get into the xylem only to maybe etch that um, as they begin feeding. The other insect, just to be kind of on the lookout for, and, and you may notice an increase of um, this native insect, the banded ash clearwing borer. Um, if you happen to see um, the sawdust being pushed out of the tree, collecting at the base of the tree or in between branches, um, you'll see the pupil casing here and a perfectly round exit hole there. Um, this often is um, 
a, a tree, an insect that attacks trees that are under stress. And so you can have an infestation uh, with a tree that um, has both. Um, and just know that um, to make sure that you're reading the label and um, if you need to also control banded ash clearwing bore, um, sometimes it's a separate um, insecticide treatment or you'd have to use a, a different product. The other um, hole that you'll notice, and so we've got the D-shaped exit hole with the one flat side, but we also have these large, more irregular kind of ragged holes. Um, a very um, good first sign of an infestation where you'll see woodpecker activity. Um, the woodpeckers are going in after the larvae underneath the bark. Um, and when they do that, you can see where this the bark is almost kind of blonde or it's been knocked off. And so again, a really kind of a, a good thing to look for early in the infestation. Lots of people are interested and in kind of wanting to know what the latest and greatest information is about the parasitoid releases. Um, there have been three Chinese parasitoid releases as well as there's been um, a finding of a native parasitoid that's been identified. We do have an entire EABU webinar with Julie Gold. Um, it is recorded on the emerald-bore.info um, website and it was um, presented in the fall of 2013 and so you could check that out and get all the information um, that you need as well as some of the, um, the supporting documentation and literature as it relates to the parasitoid releases. But some people are very interested, um, especially if EAB is kind of new to the area about the um, seed collecting and storage um, as a way to kind of continue to um, hold on to uh, the genetics of the ash tree. Um, lots of good information if you're interested in encouraging seed collecting in your state or in your region. There's been a lot of studies on the economic impact of EAB, uh, primarily in urban areas. Um, there are two studies that are indicated here on the slide that one estimates um, $10.7 billion for 25 states for the treatment, removal, and replacement of more than 17 million ash trees in developed land. And then Dr. Sidner with Ohio State did a second study, this one was done actually a little bit earlier, that his estimate was $5.2 billion to remove and replace public and private ash trees in Ohio's communities. And so, this information is really good supporting documentation, especially if you are a community trying to get resources to help um, manage and deal with emerald ash borer. There has been an enormous amount of work and studies um, on insecticide trials, and some of the first trials were done by Dr. Dave Smitley, um, and then also Deb McCullough here at Michigan State. Um, this is a, a photo of um, Dr. Smitley, a four-year imidacloprid trial that he did on a golf course in southeastern Michigan. The next few slides actually are um, associated with a study that Dr. Herms has done in Northwest Ohio, and you can see here um, 2006 uh, when the study began, all the way through 2009 where you can start to see the trees, the controlled trees or the treatments that failed. Um, those trees have been removed, and this is um, that same street in 2011. And so the dead trees um, or hazard trees had been removed, and now they're looking at um, kind of taking those same treatments um, and maybe pushing them instead of every other year to every um, third year to see how they can push that out uh, when the population density um, is much lower. Um, after the main wave of emerald ash borer goes through. So our scientists and researchers continue to learn uh, more about um, insecticide trials and, and other things about emerald ash borer. Robin mentioned the new insecticide options bulletin that you need to check out um, on emeraldashboard.info. There's also a lot of fact sheets including frequently asked questions regarding potential side effects of the systemic insecticides used to control EAB um, and those that information um, has been reviewed by multiple states and can definitely be used um, in your state. 
as time kind of progressed, um, there were some misconceptions that we often heard about um, through the media or in the public. And two of those that I just wanted to briefly talk about are insecticides are not effective, and then also the pre preemptive removal of healthy ash trees, slow emerald ash borer, um, just so that listeners um, know what the, the latest information is. The misconception that insecticides are not effective, um, there are some you know, actual quotes here, um, specifically for our urban type cities. But early on, uh, when EAB was going to be, or tried to be eradicated, um, the insecticide wasn't going to protect a, a tree um, 100%. And so the media really got the word out back in 2002, 2003, um, that you know, if homeowners opted to choose to treat their tree, um, the states could actually come in and still remove those trees. And so that message was heard loud and clear and kind of carried over even when eradication efforts were done. And so um, it is a misconception. Insecticides are, can be very effective at controlling emerald ash borer and keeping those trees alive. The other misconception is that tree removal actually slows the spread of EAB. And while it's important that communities, especially woodland owners and even landscape um, owners that have multiple trees deal with emerald ash borer um, in a way that they can afford um, to do that over a period of time, um, if you would go in and remove uh, preventatively all of the ash trees, those insects just spread out further looking for that food source. And so it's a combination of you know, what works in your community, in your own situation. Uh, but knowing that by removing those trees, um, either lightly infested or not infested at all, the insect will continue to move on. And so this just shows um, an infested um, tree lawn in the city of Toledo. And this is that same street just looking the other way. And what a difference emerald ash borer and the impact it has on a community. This is in a particular park situation, and this is kind of a word of warning that we really need to get the word out. And as you can see, this ash tree had fallen across um, the path here. And what's happening is the ash are breaking off at the roots, um, or they're snapping off at the base up to about six feet. And Kathleen Knight with the Forest Service has done a lot of research in natural areas um, to, to illustrate that uh, these trees become very brittle and dry and become very hazardous and need to be addressed. As you can see here, this is a, a campground in Ohio that um, was planted primarily of ash trees that were removed. Um, and so one of the things that the Ohio Department of Natural Resource did was uh, a signage campaign as they went into these campgrounds um, they also did mailings and um, information on the website to kind of warn campers before they got to the site that the campground has changed its look and those trees were removed because of public safety. Um, and so it really changes the look um, and maybe a campground site that was once, you know, provided a lot of shade is now kind of in, in open and, and um, just full sunlight penetration. You can see the impact on golf courses. Um, and so although the trees are a hazard, uh, once removed, there's no um, kind of break in between the different fairways, which also could be kind of dangerous. Um, this is a sign that one of our metro parks put up about hazard tree removal. Um, and they were closing some trails. Um, and so they were able to really try to be proactive and get the word out. And while they didn't close an entire park, they would close areas as they dealt with those hazard tree removals. If you have the opportunity, um, you know, trying to be positive, making, um, you know, taking lemons and making lemonades, um, these infested ash trees can um, really um, provide a lot of mulch. Uh, but a lot of those trees um, have a value more than just mulch or maybe firewood. Um, and so partnering with either a portable sawmill um, or a mill in your area, building relationships to get projects done are very important. Um, these are just some examples here. 
Um, this is down in Cincinnati where they've actually worked with the city, um, a private mill, uh, a furniture company, and they've created um, products that are used in the new um, schools that were being built at the same time. And so these are portable cubbies. They also did portable bookshelves, uh, furniture um, in a you know home situation. Um, we have a, a new company or business in Ohio. It's um, the Care Casket Company that are using primarily urban trees um, for a green casket kind of uh, product that they're selling across the country and actually into other um, areas. And then, of course, just ways to raise awareness. And uh, we're all familiar with cornhole. In Ohio, we have a D-hole game that we've started. Um, and the wood that was created uh, were ash trees that, that once stood in Ohio. With that, um, it kind of gave you a, a brief overview of what's happening um, and hopefully a taste that there's been a lot of things that have been going on and to make connections with people in the states kind of in that core zone um, and don't feel that you need to create and, and start over but really um, use information that's been developed and then maybe um, mold that or change that to modify it um, to fit your individual needs in a community um, a county or a state. And with that, um, if there are any questions, um, I'm going to turn this back over to Robin to introduce Lee. Thanks, Amy. Lee, I'm going to bring up your presentation and then you can turn on your microphone and you can begin. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. We can. Thank you to whoever just uh, typed in yes, JMB. All right. So, All right. um I'm the manager of Don't Move Firewood, which is uh managed and run by the Nature Conservancy and it's an outreach and education campaign to educate both the public and all sorts of different partners about the importance of um, not moving firewood, of buying local firewood, and, and not moving invasive species on firewood. So we're not actually emerald ash borer focused. We are firewood focused. And that'll come into play as you see my presentation. Um, very brief history of the program. Uh, it was conceived of mostly in 2007. Um, and then uh, I was hired on to manage and launch the program in, in the last few days of 2007 and then we actually got the entire thing live in 2008. So we're definitely um, sort of a child of the EAB revolution if you will. You know the the problem of firewood reached a very good penetration into the public mind of, of state and federal agencies um, in the sort of core zone of emerald ash borer but the realization that there's lots of different pests that are moved on firewood led to the the founding of the campaign don't move firewood as opposed to don't move ashwood etc um, the funding has varied through time we were started with a grant um, from a private foundation backed by money from the Nature Conservancy and then sort of grounded by money from the US Forest Service Northeastern area and then through time our funding sources have changed um, according to availability and interest. And our current primary funding source is USDA APHIS um, Farm Bill 10201 funds, which I would imagine a lot of you on the call are, are at least familiar with the concept of those. They're cooperative agreements with APHIS to um, uh, support the end goals of APHIS. So we've been managed by the Nature Conservancy the whole time. That's TNC. Sorry, I didn't um, type that out. And um, I am an employee of the Nature Conservancy. The guiding principles of Don't Move Firewood are that in order to protect trees, um, we need to slow down the movement uh, and decrease the movement of firewood as a vector for invasive species. So it's not a pest-specific approach. It's actually the opposite. It's a firewood-specific approach designed to protect from all of the potential pests that move on firewood, um, not focusing outreach on the pests themselves. 
I see Mike is typing and I'm worried you can't hear me or something. So, um, well, okay. The um, target audience for the Don't Move Firewood campaign is twofold. One is the public and um, so firewood users. And then the other is any stakeholder group who wants to do complimentary firewood outreach. We are a small staff and we don't have a multi-million dollar budget to run an international campaign. Um, so we rely on dozens, if not probably by now hundreds of partners um, throughout the United States and Canada, as well as some um, involvement and in sort of consulting with Mexican authorities to make sure that North America is consistent with the outreach about firewood in terms of what is the, the basic message. And the basic message that you can see on that fourth bullet point is don't move firewood or buy certified heat treated firewood. Um, and then the allies, like I have at the bottom, I mentioned just a moment ago, are all the different industries um, that pertain to firewood in terms of the firewood industry itself, uh, the National Firewood Association, the Association of Firewood Producers and Distributors, etc. Then also lots of different NGOs. You know, we partner with Leave No Trace and other um, prominent environmental groups that work with campers. Uh, and then a multitude of state and federal agencies. Now I see the question from Mike about any similar programs for wood pallets, and yes, the Continental Dialogue on Non-Native Forest Insects and Diseases, which is um, a group convened by the Nature Conservancy as well by my supervisor, whose name is Bill Toomey, um, does quite a bit of work with wood pallets uh, in terms of that as a potential vector. And if you have questions about the wood pallet work, we could do that at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. But the answer is yes, there are similar programs. Okay. So when people say, well, how much of an issue is this, I bring up our public polling information, which is to say that this is incredibly common. 50% of people we polled in our um, introductory research said that they use firewood at least annually. It's a little over a third using it to heat or enjoy their home, and a little over a third using it camping for outdoors, and then there's a bunch of overlap in there, and that makes about half of the people in the United States um, say that they use firewood. Now, not every single one of them moves it very far. Some of them are taking it from their backyard, cutting it down, and then burning it in their house. And of course, that's an innocent um, activity. Uh, but we do have data that I don't really have the time to get into today about um, what percentage of the public moves it, how far they move it. The moral of that story is a surprising number of them move it over 50 miles, which is generally speaking the benchmark of trouble. Um, for non-native insects and disease movement. And then also some of them move it really catastrophic distances and some of them move it fairly frequently terrible distances. <laughs> so the problem is bigger than you might actually guess as a result of those demographics. So Don't Move Firewood itself has a lot of different elements to its campaign. Each one of them addresses a different need. Um, the central website, which is that first bullet, and that's a screenshot of our website, um, is the core of the campaign. We use that to disseminate lots of information, both to the public and to our partner campaigns. Um, it has uh, an incredible wealth of content and text and different um, pieces of information that you can use for your own efforts, as well as, oh, actually, now I'm looking at this. The screenshot is old. It doesn't have funny enough, a resource library link on it, which is not important except for the fact that one of the things that we've got that people find really worthwhile is the resource library, which is a, a, a database of nearly everything we've ever produced for a state, local, or federal campaign in terms of an outreach product. So you can look up all the wheels so that you don't have to reinvent any of them. Um, we also have the gallery of pests, which is um, information that's maintained by Faith Campbell, my colleague at the Nature Conservancy, and each one of them has a uh, very carefully cited summary of the history and current stat and relatively current status of every single pest that is um, threatening North American trees that's non-native, um, as well as all the diseases and disease pest complexes. Um, and that is kept up to date to the greatest of her abilities. And it has um, usually between you know three and 20 peer reviewed journals at the bottom cited on each one. So it's a really great resource if you just need to dive into a given pest. 
Then we also have all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and then at the bottom that is our Spanish language site. So we have all these different resources for people to use if they need to get the word out about firewood and lots of different um, methods in order to use depending on you know what your grant allows, what your audience is. If you know, are you trying to reach young people? Are you trying to reach um, cooperative extension agents, etc.? You, you might be able to choose different parts of our campaign to do your work. One of the things we do that's really popular is that we give things away as much as our budget affords um, and we give out a lot of them because we try to do everything in bulk to, the, um, to make sure that it's economical. Um, in 2013 we actually had a slightly lower year than usual for giving stuff away. We gave away 132,000 things um, to 242 recipients. Now most recipients are somebody like a cooperative extension agent or um, a community forestry person with um, US Forest Service or uh, sometimes it's just a state agriculture uh, outreach specialist etc. We also give a surprising amount of, well actually an unsurprising amount of stuff to uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and similar youth groups and teachers and university <laughs> faculty etc. Now that number is completely dwarfed by our cooperative um, partnerships with state, local, and federal campaigns, that orange text at the bottom of the slide. Um, that's because every single state we work with that we do a custom campaign in then shoulders the financial uh, burden of producing the custom campaign materials. As an example, we did a custom campaign in um, California in 2013 that resulted in the awesome figure of 103,550 things, <laughs> including posters, tattoos, um, stickers, you name it, that they produced uh, with their funding. And so we are able to make the materials uh, work with our campaign. It has our imagery, it has our logo, and we save them the money of having that graphics design work. And we provide them the, the research and the know-how of what people um, respond to, and then they produce the incredible amount of materials that they can. So it's a really good thing way to get the word out um, and sort of like a, if you can imagine it like a franchise model, we franchise out with states and this, this is an example from California at the bottom here. So these are some of the different um, franchisees essentially that we've worked with. Uh, I pulled out the states from our last uh, financial report at the bottom and you can see those are all the states we worked with in the last fiscal year. That's why I've got a two-year span there. So that's actually just the, the past fiscal year. And um, the different posters up, up that we do, we use different imagery according to what local people um, would like, what they, what their environment looks like. That poster on the far right, you know, might work great uh, in my home state, Montana, but that is not a good poster for Connecticut. You know, nobody in Connecticut's going to think that looks like their experience of going camping. That's a big Rocky Mountain. And so we have lots of different versions of just about everything to make sure that every single state has an image that represents what they feel is going to look good to them and have their people, the, the public, really respond to it. We do a lot of research and writing and content creation all over the board. Um, we post to Facebook just about every day. Um, we use Twitter nearly every day, if not multiple times a day. Um, and then we also support the efforts of all sorts of other groups. The prime example of this is our new state summary project, which is an effort to make firewood regulations um, readable and simple to everybody in the United States who is accessing our website and wants to learn about what's going on either where they live in their state or at the destination of a camping trip essentially. Um, and so we took the time to research this, the um, pertinent firewood regulations, recommendations, and quarantine for every single state. Um, every single landowner that we could possibly think of, so state lands, federal lands, national parks, you name it, and then we wrote up summaries and then ground truth those summaries with every state plant health director or state plant regulatory official, depending on who was willing to return our emails. Uh, 
and then published them in a state by state directory on the website. And we're going to be updating those probably every six months, possibly annually. Um, or as people contact us, letting us know that they've gone out of date because of a change in the regulation that we may not have been aware of. Now, the, the end result of these summaries is that um, when people go to Don't Move Firewood, they actually find out what the firewood regulations are for their state, which is, it sounds so simple, but they're phenomenally complicated, overwhelmingly so. And the question we had earlier in the chat box, like, wait, is that the federal quarantine? Uh, for a state, or, because New York has other regulations, is, is perfectly pertinent question because most states actually at this point have some kind of a state regulation that often in the mind of the public is directly contradictory to a federal regulation. So they've, they've learned, oh, you know, the federal, the regulation on an emerald dashboard is I can move wood between these two states. Well, actually, it turns out both of those states you can't move wood between because the state regulations are more strict than the federal. That's a big problem for the public. Yeah. There's no hope of really getting good information out to them unless they're provided with the current um, state of affairs in every state. And that's why we have the state summary project in place. We also have what I refer to as the firewood matrix, which is basically just a glorified spreadsheet. Um, what it is is for professionals to understand the firewood situation on a nationwide basis. It's not designed for the public at all. It's way too complicated. Um, I'm happy to review it with anybody who would like to take a look at it. Uh, but what it shows you is the sort of state of affairs of um, firewood regulations all over the uh, North America. And actually, I, th I wasn't sure if I was going to have time, but it looks like I've been talking quickly enough that I might. Robin, is there any way you can pull it up for me or should I pull that up? Oh. <laughs> and you're on mute if you're talking. Excellent. Okay. Um, so this is the PDF of the, what I call the firewood matrix. And um, let's take a state, for example, that has quite a few firewood regulations. We'll go with New York just, just for fun. Or actually, that doesn't let us read the left-hand side. So let's go with uh, Minnesota instead. So in Minnesota, um, they do not, uh, starting with the first left-hand column, uh, of information. It says EXTQ, all of out-of-state firewood. That's an external quarantine for all out-of-state firewood. Now you can see across that row that quite a few states actually have one of those. For instance, Florida has an external quarantine preventing the movement of any firewood from out-of-state into Florida. But we're going to be reviewing Minnesota right now. And Minnesota does not have an external quarantine that's imposed by the state of every piece of firewood. However, Minnesota does have an external quarantine on out-of-state firewood that's hardwood firewood. You can see why this is getting complicated really quickly. They also have an external quarantine on any firewood entering from the, from Canada. Um, Canada and the United States try to keep pests from moving across the international border. So if you're coming from Canada, Minnesota has an external quarantine. Or if you're coming from an adjacent state and you're trying to bring in hardwood firewood, it has an external quarantine. But if you're trying to bring pine into Minnesota, you can do that. You can see how this is really crazy. Um, so we summarize all of this, uh, both on the firewood matrix for professional use, like I said, and also state by state on the state map on our website. Uh, I believe Robin is going to be supplying this PDF with the, at the end of the presentation, um, as well as it's fairly easily locatable on our website. And if you would like to email me for a personal copy, I can also do that. Oh, Robin's going to um, pipe in, which is excellent. Uh, and then, Robin, if, if when you're done, okay, great, it's, it'll be on emeraldashboard.info. And then if you could flick it back over to my PowerPoint, that would be great. Robin is the best Vanna White of Adobe present ever. <laughs> Okay, so and I included on this presentation um, the actual URL at the bottom. You can see here just so that you would have it written down in case anybody wanted to just grab it off the PowerPoint uh, after the presentation is over. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, that's uh, Adam saying that Robin's the best Vanna White. Okay, so then the other thing that we do is, like I said, the research and writing. And part of that is just producing things that you can copy and paste onto your own website or your own um, uh, outreach materials or extension presentation or, or what have you. Um, it is quite comical to me to see stuff that I've written years and years ago pop up on brand new materials. But what that means is that it's effective and that we are not wasting our time trying to wordsmith the best things to write because there things have already been written that are very effective. There's no need to to um, to spend a lot of time with it if you can just grab it off the Don't Move Firewood site. And that's what we're designed for. We're trying to make everything streamlined. We all have firewood vectored pests in our state. Let's just all do it the same way and keep it real straightforward. We also pre present the, so that's the example I give is our frequently asked questions show up as frequently asked questions on lots of other people's websites, which are great. You know, we, you don't have to write those twice. The other thing is that we write our Dear Don't Move Firewood advice column. We receive emails roughly once a week, if not more often, depending on the time of year, just asking us, hey, I'm going camping you know, and they say, I'm going camping in Alabama. Can I bring my firewood from Ohio? And sometimes the actual answer, although I don't think in that example, um, is yes, legally speaking, you can. But because we're a nonprofit and we're not really bound to give the party line of any particular agency, I can say, but it's, you know, it's a, that's a really, really bad idea, even though it's legal, technically speaking. Um, Another example is that somebody asked me recently for advice on um, whether or not it's okay to buy firewood from a big box store. And, you know, we were able to sort of pontificate on, well, yes, you can, but actually in your part of the country, big box store firewood is entirely unregulated. So it's no different than moving it hundreds of miles in, in a way because you can't guarantee it's been sourced responsibly due to the lack of regulations in that part of the country. That's just one more example. So the, the last thing that I'm going to chat about, um, and then we'll do a couple questions. I'm, I guess I'm a couple minutes over. Sorry about that. Um, is our Firewood Outreach Professional newsletter. We produce a newsletter 10 times a year via email. Um, it's becoming really popular. I think we've passed over the 500 subscription mark. Um, and what we do is we just talk about regulations, infestations, um, the coolest outreach programs that other people are doing that are not ours um, so that you can get the word out about independent efforts that we think are really effective and um, sometimes really innovative. And then outreach efforts, efforts that are ours so that we can show you all the neat things that we're working on and doing that could help you do your job of educating people um, to the best of your ability. Um, I highly suggest you all sign up for it. Uh, we are skipping June because June is a madhouse and I think people probably won't be reading their email very much, but we'll be back online in July. Um, and that's why we do 10 times a year. We skip uh, December and June. This is a, a quick acknowledgement of all of our outstanding financial supporters. Uh, we are managed and run by the Nature Conservancy, but we cannot do our job without the continued financial support of USDA APHIS, which we ex are extremely thankful for. We also have a few private foundations that um, have funded us fairly extensively, including the Grantham Foundation for the Environment and the Terriot Foundation, rhymes with chariot, and then some smaller private groups. Um, and then the U.S. Forest Service, different regional offices have funded us through time. Um, you know, right now, today, we are not receiving funding from the Forest Service, but we have in past fiscal years, and we look forward to getting grants in the future from them because they have been a big supporter. And these are a couple quick links for you all to scribble down or copy and paste into your browser if you want to see what we do. And um, I am always on email. And now I've got one minute for questions. Sorry for running over, everybody. And you can do questions via chat box, uh, or maybe Robin can field um, microphone questions. I don't know. We do have a couple minutes if um, you have any questions and, or comments. 
Um, Lee, thank you so much. This was great to get a get a, a quick and uh, thorough um, overview of what goes on with the Don't Move Firewood group, and that's which is a, a very important thing for our whole, you know, keeping this uh, invasive pests out of our our trees and keep them around. I see folks are typing, so we'll hang on here and see what pops up. I see Joy wants to know if there's any breeding programs for developing resistant ash. Uh, Amy's going to answer that question for us. Um, there's been some work, um, probably multiple agencies, but I'm familiar with the work done at the Forest Service Lab in Delaware, Ohio, um, with Kathleen Knight and um, and others um, with Dan Herms. And so that information is on the emeraldashboard.info website, um, at least to get you linked up. Um, I think it is their plan in the near future to be able to um, have folks um, input information if they're seeing um, some trees that are maybe less impacted um, to to report those um, and then do some following up um, but they are doing active research um, in the Delaware Ohio um, location oh you're asking about once um, EAB is in your area will you have to treat trees forever is there a light at the end of the tunnel that's some of the research that Dr. Dan Herms is doing where um, once the population kind of crashes or is reduced um, to kind of instead of treating let's say every year with maybe imidacloprid um, to space that out and so that information and that data is still being collected um, but it looks uh, pretty promising and so they'll continue to, to look at that and share that information. Have there been any, let me see here, I'm sorry, again. is there any harm in treating ash trees yearly with injections? I know it's suggested every two years. Um, if you want to, I suppose that's okay, but you're, that also means you're putting more, more money into something and effort that, you know, you maybe you don't have to. Um, it's, as, as always with any kind of use of any kind of insecticide, you have to read the label and, and follow the directions there. Okay, let's see here. Have there been any populations of ash found on the continent that have shown I'm, I'm uh, immunity or I think resistance? Oh, okay. Um, I actually did talk to Dr. Uh, McCullough a few weeks ago a little bit about this. Um, we're seeing some indications that occasionally uh, you can have green ash that are dying and not very far away you will have white ash that don't seem to be affected as quickly. Um, they're still studying why this kind of phenomenon occurs. It's not something that's consistent, but there are some, you know, there are some quirks that have, we've seen. But again, it's a good thing if you see such things to let someone know. You can even email one of us because we work with the folks that do this kind of thing. And uh, we can get that information to them. But right now, um, the there the ash from um, what is it the ash the Manchurian ash that comes from Asia shows more resistance than others. But under heavy population pressure of EAB, they will also succumb. What are the ecological implications of applying imidacloprid long term and its effects on pollinator honeybee health? Um, there's a, there is a publication that Amy Stone spoke about that talks about the effects of um, insecticide use and that kind of thing. Also, Dr. Herms discussed in a recent webinar with us about how honeybees usually um, have not been affected by this because ash trees are, despite the fact that they have flowers and that kind of thing, they are pollinated by wind and not by honeybees. And in their studies, they have watched different areas of ash trees and when honey, when bees are out looking for and foraging, and they have never seen honeybees land on ash trees at this point.
Okay. Let's see if we've got anything else that I've missed here. Did we, let's see, did we answer about the treating ash trees forever? Okay. Okay. These are good, these are good questions. Thanks everyone for bringing this up. And I, a lot of this information, again, can be found on the emerald-dashboard.info site. And we have on that site, if you're there, there's also information by state um, and by topic. You can search it and look for it that way. I'm not familiar with wild bees that burrow in the ground. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have any answer to that question, Joy. Is there any evidence that EAB will be eradicated in an area that has been infested? No. All right, I'm going to bring up the slide for the survey. And hopefully we'll get a little more feedback from folks. Yes, there we go. Um, we're hoping that to bring you even more information, maybe next year during EAB Awareness Week, we're hoping we can bring you more information as far as any kind of updates on uh, on research that talks about ash trees that may be resistant, um, information that helps us figure out um, more good ways to manage um, our ash resource in, in cities that are dealing with this. And there's a lot of information, again, from our researchers that shows there are ways to deal with emerald ash borer and the population, way to slow some of the spread and that kind of thing that um, really so far, the, every year that we are we have uh, are adding to this infestation, um, we are also finding out more and more about it and how to deal with it. Thank you, Adam.